everybody and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Ordinary Miracles. Ordinary Miracles is a show about everyday miracles happening all around us and I myself have been on a 24 year journey of healing and I have seen the most amazing miracles lit literally through the magic of the human touch. So today's show is about music therapy and our guest is John Carpenty but before I get into John and how brilliant he is I want to just share with our viewers a little bit about what I discovered when I was researching Malloy College and music therapy. I was so impressed with something that I read, and I want to share that with you. I'm going to read it to you. It, what it says on the website is, music therapy is a humanistic philosophy that uses music and specially designed musical experiences to improve the quality of lives of children and adults with disabilities or illnesses. It's a therapeutic process with clinical goals. I love that, John. I love that. I thought that was so interesting. So now let me tell everybody about you and how amazing you are. So Dr. John Carpenty is the founder and executive director of the Rebecca Center for Music Therapy at Malloy College. You're also the founding clinical director of the Center for Autism and Child Development, the owner of Developmental Music Health Services. And Dr. Carpenty has over 15 years of clinical and supervisory experience serving, serving groups with developmental, neurological, and emotional challenges. And your focus is on individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders and their families, parent coaching, assessment, and supervision. Also, you have authored several um, chapters of books and um, you also articles, and you yourself have a couple of books that you've authored, right? One book. One book. <laughs> What's the name of that book? Uh, individual Music Centered Assessment Profile. It's a, it's a clinical manual on how to assess um, individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. So, John, thank you so much for letting me come here and see your brilliant program and, and talk to you today. I appreciate the time a lot. And I really want to find out about your journey. I, I want to see how, why music therapy? How, can you tell us about your journey and, and how it started? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for coming. I appreciate you being here and I'm honored to be part of the program. Um, it's a long journey. <laughs> I'm still on the journey. Um, I was a, well, I've been a musician since uh, I was a teenager, I guess, and was in the music scene, played in bands, had part of a, a, a part to do with a record label, did the touring, the producing, and uh, I loved it. But um, as I was getting older, I was realizing that there was something missing. I think I was going through this existential crisis, so to speak. Yes. And um, so I went back to college, because so I dropped out like four or five times prior, because I was going to be a rock star. Of course you were. You don't need college if you're going to be a rock star, right? Right, Mike? <laughs> so <laughs> so, so um, I started to go back to school for music. And not really knowing why I was doing that, but I just couldn't see myself going to college for something else, right? Um, and I was, as I was studying there, uh, a professor of mine, her name was Evelyn Seleski, she uh, taught an introductory course to music therapy. I knew nothing about this, but I was instructed to take this class. It's a great class. She's a great instructor. I said, okay, I'll take the class. And um, so I took the class. It was really interesting. And it just showed another avenue of what you could do with music and the powers of music that, you, uh, that, that, that can be... Uh, used to, to um, I guess, to heal folks, you know, uh, depending on their ailment. You know, music is, is be, I've seen music being used in hospitals and in schools and on, on uh, oncology units and in hospice care. Um, and so I never knew about all these things. And as I took the course, I still didn't quite understand how this worked. Because a lot of folks think music is this miracle, you know, it's just magic. Right. Um, but I, I needed to know more. Well, so can you explain to us how does music therapy work? Um, well, it depends on, you know, your philosophy of music therapy. Here at the Rebecca Center, we practice a humanistic framework, as you read, and so we're looking at we're looking at the person in a holistic way, and so primarily here at the Rebecca Center, we work with kids on the spectrum, with the on, uh, they're diagnosed with autism, and so a core feature of autism is, is uh, includes challenges in being able to relate and communicate to others. And I always thought that music naturally speaks to this. I mean, uh, music is such a social event when right. it's happening between people. Um, here, we believe in active music making, where 
the child is actually making music with the therapist. He doesn't, requ doesn't require any skill, musical skill, on the part of the child. We have all these different types of percussive instruments that are either pitched or not pitched, and the child can play on a drum or a xylophone. It's the therapist's job to improvise on the piano or voice or guitar to try to engage the child in some back and forth communication that's going on. And these are things that kids with autism have difficulties with. Sometimes they can maybe be in a related experience for five seconds or ten seconds. But we try to get this back and forth going where we follow what they do. We're not forcing them into playing music. We're not teaching them music. We're just following their emotional place and how they make music. It could be a kid who's perseverating on a drum. Well, now I can bring the piano in and synchronize to his drumming. And let's see, is he aware of me playing this drum? And I get some eye contact, he looks up. I said, oh, right, let me bring some more tempo in. And now he starts playing, he's asserting his will. And I put a pause in the music, and then he punctuates the symbol. So when the outsider looks in on this, they go, oh, that's nice, he's making music. But really, what is he doing? Well, he's shifting his attention. He understands the end of a phrase, so he's adjusting his play to, to meet the musical cues. He's watching the therapist for different things. Um, all of these things are prerequisites for learning, right? And uh, one of the other, well, one of many great things about music, it really includes all of the senses. So if you think about the child has to hold the mallets, he has to take the visual stimuli coming in from the, from the space, being the therapist, the lights, managing all of the sensory stimuli, and then being able to take in cognitively what's happening musically to respond to it. Uh, kids with, because that we see here have a hard time integrating the senses. So music naturally integrates um, these things. And so that's really a, 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 a little bit of, of what we do. And so it's within the musical play that we engage the yeah. kids in, where the goals emerge, clinical goals, and we, we develop those uh, in conjunction with the parents and say the, t the child's uh, <clears throat> other therapist or, or, or teacher, and we incorporate here into their musical treatment plan. Well, so now I understand a little bit how it works, and I got to experience your program a little bit, and you, you were playing the piano, and I was playing the drums, and it was really interesting to see what you were looking for, what you, you were going faster sometimes, you were going a little slower, and I didn't really understand what you were doing, but now I do. You pay attention to all those cues, and then you develop the, the goals and the programs based on where the child is, or where the person is. That's right. Oh, it's so brilliant. It is so interesting. Well, so what kind of person does it take to become a music therapist? Um, well, first of all, to be musical is going to be just like a talk therapist and has to have command of the language and also the social mores of the culture. Uh, the music therapist should be well versed in music, musical styles, um, different types of music. Uh, to be a board certified music therapist, you have to meet certain competencies. So the therapist needs to be proficient on piano, guitar, and voice and percussion. Uh, here at Malloy College, we have an undergraduate program, and the students that come in are already musicians, just like I was when I came here as a student. And now we teach them how to use music in a clinical way and throughout those four years of being here. Um, some students want to go on into more in-depth works. So they go on to grad school, and there's where we teach them how to work in music in a music psychotherapeutic way, um, where we're bringing in all these different psychotherapeutic theories <coughs> into into how this is contextualized musically. And so that's it. But it also, I think it, 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 it screams for a person who wants to help people. Um, right. And who realizes that music can be something um, that can, you know, benefit folks, you know, folks that are um, going through a range of challenges, whatever that might be, uh, whether it's cognitive, uh, emotional, uh, motor, whatever that might be. Um, so it does take, um, I guess, a unique person to to do this. I think so, but then again, you know, I'm one well, of them, so sense. I don't know. <laughs> and you're still a rock star, John. I mean, this is a rock star kind Thank of you work that much. you're doing. So you, this room in particular that we're sitting in, you said that this is for groups, and, um, and there's a picture on the wall that has um, a picture. Did the kids draw that picture, or who drew that picture? Well, we have uh, groups of, we, we do see kids in, in a group context, and so some kids that are able to be in a, a group music session, we have them come in. And this particular group that you're talking about, this, this um, artwork was the cover of a CD that was created by all of the kids in the group. 
Before that was created, we had him in here, and we engaged him in songwriting. So we brought our garage band recording studio in and recorded all these different parts. Like they were, We wanted to bring them to a recording studio, the real life of being in a studio. And with being in a studio, you have to learn to listen. You have to learn not to speak when the red button is on. You have to learn to collaborate with your partners in music. So it's all of these things that we don't we take for granted every day. Yeah. You know, these social things that go on in a, in a music session that are happening with these kids. And then at the end, we have this great CD that was produced in a co-creative manner. And then they came up with the idea of this. This was the artwork of the CD. And then we performed the CD for the families, you know, live, in a live way. And we also made a, but some we actually made a music video to go with the music. Wow. We'd take them into the street. You know, where again, social things have to happen, right? Yeah. Um, so it's really the process of making these things more than it is the product. But the product is nice because it's part of the process, right? Absolutely. It's like a reward in the end. Or you could say, look back and go, hey, look what we just did. Exactly, look what we created. Because a lot of these kids, they don't have Little League. You know, they yeah. can't go to Little League and get the trophies and play hockey. And the parents, you know, you know don't get to see them you know, hitting a ball or scoring a goal or whatever it is. So this is something that in a way can be that for them. Absolutely. I can see that. So I heard a story about you before I interviewed you. Uh-oh. So, <laughs> was, look, this is a, a show for kids too. Oh, okay. I'm not, we're not going to tell any kids <laughs> about so I, I heard that you, when you were getting this program started, that you used to drive for half an hour, 45 minutes, and take yeah. all your equipment and set it up just for one kid. Yep. What, what made you do that, John? Well, first of all, uh, I was working in a hospital at the time on an AIDS unit with people afflicted with HIV and AIDS. I was there for five years, and I realized that I wanted to have my own clinic. I just didn't know how to get it going. So I just said, I'm going to do this. And so I left the job one year before being vested. Everybody thought I was crazy. Wow. <laughs> they, they Your said, parents must have loved that. My mother just was happy that I went back to college. <laughs> that was the only thing. You know, she wanted, you could always go back to college. But she still thought I could play baseball at 32. But that's all. Thing. So, yeah. um, so um, I decided to leave. And I found a space in the basement of a church. And only because... Uh, the, the person who did the music at this church was a college professor of mine, uh, the choral director of a choir that I was in. And uh, he was nice enough to bring me in, and they rented out the space to me. There was a huge, huge room that was used for so many different things. So I had to get this super, it was, in, it was way out in uh, Melville. I lived in Astoria, Queens at the time. That's a job. Yeah, and all my gear. So all the stuff you see here, you know, I, all my gear in my car every Saturday. I had one client, one kid, for 30 minutes. So I'd set up the room, have to cover all the toys that were there, get the dividers from the basement, dripping in sweat. And so I proceeded to work with this kid for 30 minutes. It, it was it, it, over an hour to get to this place. And then it started to grow. Uh, two kids, three kids, four kids, and the whole day was filled. And I had another day filled. And another day was filled. And then I decided to um, create a nonprofit. At that time, it was just, you know, I was a sole proprietor. It was just me, and parents were paying out of pocket to me. So I want to make this bigger than me, right? And so I, I took a couple of MBA courses to learn how to to to, to, to do to create a nonprofit, a 501c3. Uh, back then, they didn't have all these pro bono lawyers doing things like that, so I had to do everything myself. Pay for it. Exactly. Yeah. So I put a board of directors together and uh, uh, started this non for profit and was making $25 a week. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was, 25 bucks a week. And um, I thought I would engage in grant writing and, and, and get some money that way. And I did do that, but right when that was happening, 9-11 happened. And tsunami happened right after that, too, or right before that, I forget. So money was being, you know, giving, money was being put out to those worthy causes, you know. Yeah. And really, probably more worthy than what I was doing, you know, was to help families suffering from what was going on in the world. So it was the worst time to start a non-for-profit because there's only X amount of money, X amount of dollars in the pool when you're yeah. trying to, right? So we did fundraising events and the client base kept growing. So I came to Malloy College because I was a former student there. I said, hey, you want a clinic? Um, and they said, okay. I said, well, just rent out the space. I'll pay you the rent and that's what I did. And I rented out the space and um, created payroll, the whole night, everything, right? on my own and hired a couple of therapists 
and it grew. We had one treatment room, and it grew. <clears throat> and the, the agreement was that I would train the Malloy students. And so they came for internship experiences. And it, you know, we, we outgrew the space, and then I think it was 2000 and, I don't know, eight or nine, where um, the board, the board of directors of the Rebecca Center uh, decided it would be better if Malloy took it over, and then they would be fiscally responsible. Um, and they agreed to do that, and so uh, I said, well, I, you have to keep the name. The name is my, my late grandmother, her name was Rebecca. And so that's, the values of the center really are built around her. Wow, you know? goosebumps, that's really honoring And I get her. carried away too when I think about it. <laughs> yeah, because that's so special that you did that. Yeah. She must be smiling down. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they get choked up with that. But anyway. Sorry about that. No, 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 it's fine. It's part of the, you know, and so they said. Yeah, part yeah, of the journey. It's part like. of the journey, right. And at the time I was still making music, and I was really, uh, it, really into this label. We just got signed and got on tour, and we just did a, a, a California tour. And so I was caught in these worlds, you know. Wow. It's kind of like the uh, the material versus the uh, spiritual. Yeah, you know, you know? it's a real crossroads to be there. Yeah, yeah. kind of like you know uh, what's it, you know Cat Stevens with the album he has with the uh, the chocolate. Yes. And the um, uh, he's 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 reflecting. He's caught between the spiritual and the material. You know? Not that I'm Cat Stevens, <laughs> but I, 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 I don't know about that. But just because you're wearing different hats, you yeah. know, it's a whole different thing. But in any event, I decided to leave and sell my shares and label and the studio to do this. And um, and that's kind of how it went about. Then I went on to get my PhD because I wanted to know why music works. Yeah. I want to know. I want to do research. Why, why, what's going on? It, it, it has to be fundamental. It cannot be. It can't be magic, right? <clears throat> uh, first of all, grants aren't going to pay for magic. You know, they're going to pay for well. How do we know this works? Um, and through being here, developing my own model, and researching it now. Um, and it's grown, and so uh, we have uh, five music therapists that work here, psychologists and education specialists. I mean, I've, the only reason why this place is where it's at is because of those folks. I'm just behind the scenes there in the trenches. I don't think so. I mean, when I'm listening to your journey and I, I see what you've done to create this, from driving all those and setting up that room and, and all the effort you put in the $25 a week, that's blood, sweat, and tears. You make it sound that's like true. so easy and a lot of faith. You know, I mean, how you how were you supporting yourself? Like how you just it sounds like you put in so much effort and look what you've created. I mean, it, this is magical. I know you're saying it's not magic, but this is magical, John. It's amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's uh, yeah. No, that was yes. That was blood, sweat, and tears. And I, I'm pretty thick, so whenever my mindset on something, <laughs> I just don't stop. Which, well, thank God for that because look where we're sitting. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, but but uh, yes, I agree. thank you. It's, it's, no, I, I agree true. with you, I'll take the credit, but to move it, to get to where it's beyond me, it, it really takes the hand of, of other folks. And it's really cool when I walk, you know, we videotape all the sessions, and I'm walking by a clinician supervising a student, and they're talking about what's going on in the session, I'm behind them, right? And I look, and I'm like, wow, you know, it's bigger than me now. Yeah. Like, you know, I, don't, I, I can be home, you know, and, or when I, if and when the time comes that I leave here, if that happens, It'll always be here. That was always the, wow. the the goal, right? Where regardless of me being part of it, it still run, it still work, yeah. as long as the values are still intact. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this. So I can see how this is part of who you are. It's your destiny. And how do you deal with a situation if this has ever happened that somebody comes in and you unable to help them? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that disappointment? Well, uh, it's tricky because um, I don't look at it like that. I just, um, if we have a child who's just really having a hard time, he just needs our help more. And I mean, sometimes parents, you know, they feel bad sometimes. And I go, hey, look, if he wasn't doing this, whatever he might be doing, trashing the room, having a meltdown, he wouldn't need to be here, you know? Yeah. And so we have to do a better job. That's what wow. I love about it. Uh, because I do believe anyone can be engaged, whether it's music or through whatever. We just have to find the right music for him or her. And to do it in a way that's sensitive to their nervous system, that's sensitive to their individual differences, that's really just with that's what's getting in their way, and it's our job to, to to help, you know, make that happen. So, if we have to contact everybody who's working with this kid, if we, we go to the we go to their homes to see what's going on in the house, um, we'll do it, you know. Um, so yeah, I look at it as a challenge, and, and I'm pretty lucky. Everyone like that. He, everyone here is like that. 
You know, it's like our mission to figure out how we can engage this little guy or girl yeah. in a musical experience. Sometimes we also have to come to, you know, an idea that maybe music isn't the right thing for him or her, too. We might have some kids who have auditory, um, auditory challenges where they're not processing sound in a certain way. Um, so we might, that might come into play. But even so, we use other things that we, can, that we constitute as music. So we have puppets. We use puppets. And we'll do it in a musical way, which not, may not look like conventional music making, you know what I mean? Or we have, um, I'll show you, we have a, a toy room in there where we have like sensory-based toys and symbolic toys that are dolls and houses. And we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate musical themes in those things. Come out of a session dripping in sweat, <laughs> you know, trying to engage a kid. Uh, and it's not always, sometimes not always, but it's whatever it takes. But if we do see, if there's a contraindicator in there that might say, Maybe music is in the right medium. What's great now is that we have, you know, psychologists who might have an idea. We can check in with the education specialist who might have an idea, um, and then the music therapist. So we have all this, you know, a, a multi-perspective, you know, way yeah. of, of seeing the child. So amazing! And what's your favorite part of this job? Oh, uh, making music. Same job with you. It's making music with the kids. I don't do as much of it now because I, I do a lot of administrative stuff. Yeah. Um, that and the research. I never thought I'd be a researcher. I never had any interest in that. I just wanted to be a clinician. Um, when I, was, I, went, I did my PhD at Temple University, and I remember my, uh, my mentor said to me, you're going to be a researcher. I'm like, I'm not going to be a researcher. <laughs> you're going to be a researcher. I'm a researcher. So that's one of the things I, I, I like, you know, because one of the things that... When we do research here, we're trying to find things that haven't been done. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. I don't see the point in doing something that someone's yeah. done already. So it requires more work, but it's very cool when we do something different and can find something new. Um, we were involved in the, we're currently involved in the largest non-pharmacological study in autism. It's an international multi-site study that started, the money came out of uh, the University of Bergen in Norway. It's a six million dollar grant that like ten countries are involved in, and we're the U.S. site. Wow. So, which is very nice. That's incredible. It, 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 very incredible to be part of this. And the people that are involved in this study, these are my people that I've read about. You know, now I'm on this team of brilliant, brilliant uh, <laughs> researchers and clinicians. Uh, and so, when the study is completed, it'll have over 400 participants. No autism stu study ever has had that because of attrition. But the main PI was smart enough to realize that we can do that if we involve different countries. And so this is our fifth year of this study, and it's coming to an end. Our final meeting in Bergen will be in November. It's incredible information that you must be getting and going to continue oh, to get from the study. It's amazing. It's going to help so many people. I hope so. And just to be around these people, the, yeah. the professionals. It's and meet It's amazing. So I'm just really lucky. It's your peeps, John. That's my peeps. <laughs> I can't be around smart people, you know? It's, it's my peeps. So, well, this show is called Ordinary Miracles, and so well, I would like to hear from you a story that you consider a miracle in someone you've worked with, or... I've, there's so many great stories, you know. Um, but there's one uh, that, that I'm thinking about, because it's come full circle in a way. When I was working by myself, you know, in that church basement, I met this little boy who was five years old. And uh, his mom came to word of mouth, and we're working together. And just very musical, just like very easily can play. You could see there was something in him that aligned with music. But he was so musical that he was able to use music to keep people from him. You know, it was always, he could use that so he wouldn't have to engage in other types of things. And he was so good that people would just think, well, that was great, and that would be it. And he taught me how to become a better, I had to be a better musician if I was, if I was going to engage him. So that's what happened. And I learned a lot from this little guy. And he got older. And so when I moved here to Malloy, several years later, mom, uh, his whole family, you know, they, they came as well. Parents were just terrific people and very supportive of what was going on here. And so he was with me probably until he was 12 years old and then outgrew us, you know. And, out was, and every once in a while, I wish mom would check in, you know, and I'd get a Christmas card, a holiday card, and a picture of him. He's getting big, you know. And a couple of years ago, um, I do open house here at Malloy, you know, to meet the incoming, or prospective students, and then the incoming freshmen. And I meet 
uh, high school students and, and their parents. And so all the people are coming in. And all I see, I see his mom. I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I forget how old the kid is now. I said, well, well this, I don't, I'm not going to say his name, but he, uh, he's considering coming to Malloy, but he's going to major in psychology. Long story short, he's a college student now. He's a communications major. No way. Yeah. And so as he's here now, he's, I think this is wow. his second year, he would always come down and visit me. And we've gotten him involved in some of the work. Yeah, which has been really great. And he's really brilliant. A brilliant musician. Mom's brilliant. Good people. And they're always very supportive. The fundraising always there. And, and I, it was like a, a really a, a privilege, you know, yeah. to be part of their life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and especially, I mean, he, it wasn't because of me that this all happened. I was just playing a little part in it, you know. He had, all, you know, he, you know, he had other people working with him too. But just to have that musical thing with him, he ended up also becoming the top snare drum player on Long Island. He played a jazz ensemble. He, just had, he had an affinity for music, so that I think helped grow his affinity for music. If that's impossible. So he was in jazz ensemble. He was in an orchestra. And he was just excelled in music, and so now, he's ironically, you know, he's a communications major. He has a diagnosis of autism. He's a, he's a communications major. That is unbelievable. <laughs> so that's there's there's so many great stories. You know, it's pretty pretty cool. Sounds that's a proper miracle story. <laughs> it sounds like you learn from each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, John, you, I really, I, you know, I want to thank you so much for telling us about your story and your program and just for all the incredible stuff you do in the world and for helping all these people, the families, the people. It's really magic that happens here with you. I can feel it, I can see it, and you're so humble. You keep saying, it's not me, it's not me, you know, but it is you, so thank you. And, you know, I just want to remind our viewers that there's magic in the human touch, as you can see from John and his story, and, you know, expect miracles. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>